bridging cognitive science with education um, is still, you know, in <laughs> in the very beginning. Um, uh, and also, for example, neuroscience. Uh, maybe cognitive psychology has done a lot of research for many years, but neuroscience is very new. And so I think that taking an interdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. and uh, preparing our teachers, for example, to become literate in all these uh, scientific language, but also to become very aware of how human beings learn, um, will give them the tools to make the right decisions in the classroom, because you cannot um, take um, something that has been studied in cognitive science and say, okay, so then I have a recipe and we're going to apply it exactly like this, and it's going to produce this effect on this brain. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing to understand is that every brain is unique. And um, so the context is very important. And so teachers really need to be prepared uh, and have all these tools in order to, for them to make moment-to-moment -moment decisions that are correct and that benefit their students' learning. Imagine that your memory is the biggest bottle in the world. And it has no end, no bottom. It'll hold all kinds of knowledge that you can possibly accumulate. But it's got this very, very, very narrow neck when it comes to actually learning new material consciously. This is what working memory is. It is extremely narrow. When you know nothing, and for the last 60 years they've been saying it holds like seven items plus or minus two for maybe 12 seconds, 15 seconds. When we're more educated, it actually holds four items that are much bigger, much longer trains of items. And that means that we all have to live with this restriction. All of us, and we do not realize it, have this very narrow window before our eyes. So whatever you heard 10 minutes ago, you either understood it, and it started going down, the, it's gone through the bottleneck into the big bottle to sit somewhere in your cognitive networks and look at how the memory or cognitive networks sit. It's knowledge connected, almost like molecules with bonds, bonds of different strengths. They're almost rules of memorability. We remember some things better than others on the basis of certain experimentally produced you know, norms. So it sits there. If you understood it well enough, you can link it to something you already know, et cetera. So the important thing is then to understand that speed strangely matters. In order to serve for you to have enough space to think, You've got to read in milliseconds, count or do operations of single digits in milliseconds and effortlessly. What we do in learning is connect one little piece to another little piece with practice, and that's how we make long railroads you know, of knowledge that actually passes one piece into working memory. The essential learning task, of course, of parents and homes, but of schools, and particularly when the students have illiterate parents, the whole task lies on schools, is to take this one piece to little piece, let's say one letter to little letter, you see them two or three times together, they're likely to come together, they may not, and make them into increasingly bigger chunks. Practice those enough, and enough means a lot of different things, until they become long chains that very quickly are recognized within milliseconds and can then show up, pass through working memory. This then means you need to, again, read in milliseconds, count in milliseconds, so that you have time in working memory to think of what you read, bring up new old knowledge in milliseconds, mix it all up and make a decision. This is what education actually needs to aim. In case of the brain, are the information processing uh, is made by the parallel distributing processing. That means the, everything uh, just uh, going parallel. For example, in case of the visual system, uh, when the, we see uh, something uh, like this, we just uh, resolve all the components like lines, orientations, and also color and uh, motion. And uh, the brain will process 
all these kind of things independently, and then we will get together all of them. So the important thing is so what uh, I see is might be different from what you see. So uh, the how to solve this problem? So uh, the imaging must be very important because by the non-invasive imaging, we can take a look at such kind of the parallel distributing process uh, independently. According to today's re research, there is no such thing as learning styles. We all process information in the same general ways. Humans, apparently, as well as animals. The point is some of us are much better at certain things and use shortcuts, so it may be, seem to you to say, I learn things visually, or I learn things auditorily. Well, whenever you think you're learning things visually, so probably does everybody else. The big problem is that faculties of education do not teach these cognitive science basics. People, for instance, are not aware that they have a working memory. It's not something that stands out in our eyes. So we in development agencies, as I spent in the World Bank, we get these hordes of graduates of colleges of education to whom then I have to tell them that they've got such a thing as working memory, therefore speed, therefore teachers have working memory. And a whole lot of stuff that we assume and we blame them for being not doing is because it falls out, they go into cognitive memory overload, it doesn't hold its well, and the less educated people, the more slowly they bring up known knowledge. All of this stuff is fairly explainable. As you see, it's not terribly complicated. It does boil down to things that are quite applicable. Some neuroscientists say uh, the brain science is very deep. Uh, we don't know anything. And it's uh, too early to apply uh, the results of neuroscience to a real world. But it's uh, too much. There are lots of things we already know, already know, already knew. In that case, uh, I think we had better utilize such kind of results to various kind of fields. But of course, the neuromythology, we should be very careful of that. So the, when the OECD published a book of understanding brain, a birth of learning science, at that time we discussed and discussed, and we put one chapter that uh, dispelling new myth. And uh, it uh, made a big influence all over the world. So many people uh, became a little bit careful about this kind of thing. I think that brings us to the uh, role of emotion and the role of uh, beliefs <laughs> in, uh, in learning. And yes, there has been evidence about the growth mindset or fixed mindset. And to everyone who doesn't know what that is, uh, growth mindset means that you believe that you can, that intelligence or that ability can be improved. It's not like you're born with a certain amount of ability to learn, and that's it. And so uh, growth mindset, there has been research behind growth mindset, not necessarily neuroscientific research, but there is some neuroscientific research about the role of emotion and learning, and I think that is very much related to the growth mindset. And yes, emotion, when an emotion fights <laughs> with um, learning or with something to be learned, it, it's been said that the emotion wins.